So we're going to start um, with the beat generation, move into happenings, talk about gutai, fluxus, and performance art in this section. Um, the beat generation was led by a man named Allen Ginsberg. Um, it was basically the 1950s reaction to mainstream life. Uh, the beat generation felt like consumerism and gender roles that were dictated in society were um, sort of killing Americans. <laughs> um, they really felt that good old American values were um, unsettling. Ginsburg felt that the LGBTQ, the poor, and drug addicts were all alienated from society based on this model of society. Ginsburg was a writer and founded the Beat Generation. Uh, there were other writers that went along with him, like Jack Kerouac and Lawrence Ferlinghetti. Um, they were all frustrated with the mainstream of popular culture in the 50s that was brought about by the settling of the Industrial Revolution. Um, the Beats bonded over jazz music, alcohol, Zen Buddhism, and substances. Um, they begin their own experience that pushes back against conformity. Um, Ginsburg said, I saw the best vines of my generation destroyed by madness, starving, hysterically naked. They were burned alive in their innocent flannel suits on Madison Avenue or run down by the drunken taxi cabs of absolute reality. Um, there was a collection of poems written, written by Ferlinghetti um, in 1950. He believed in the Coney Island of the mind. He felt that the mind is where the best, most inclusive and fulfilling experiences are had. And you can still buy Lawrence Ferlinghetti's book online here uh, on Amazon. You can get it for $10.95 just in case you wanted to read it. Robert Frank was a photographer during um, this is American regionalism in photography. This is his photograph trolley from New Orleans. Um, it was done in 1955 and it is currently at the Institute of Chicago. It was from a series called the Americans. Um, altogether, Robert Frank was considered one of the most influential photographers in history. Um, he approaches the subject matter with a sense of curiosity for the people that he's photographing. He wants to tell their story. He wants to dig at the social issues within the construct of society. He refuses to conform to the pressures of society. He wants his photography to be raw, psychologically revealing. Um, he wants his photographs to highlight loneliness and isolation that are the characters of post-war identity. Um, he was the first European to see, to receive a Guggenheim fellowship. He spent two years traveling by car through the United States, photographing his personal reactions to the U S. Um, the culmination of the expedition of the expedition was 1959. He was, his photographs were published in a book called the Americans. Um, the novelist Jack Kerouac said in his introduction to the book that was published of Frank's work, Frank sucked a sad poem right out of America onto film. He presents an unromanticized portrait of a nation that was rapidly changing. He recognized various aspects of American life and society, in particular, the car culture. 
Uh, it was evolving around a new system of interstate highways. This particular photograph is of a streetcar in New Orleans. Um, it reveals the social tensions that were rooted in the South in the 50s. Um, it reveals segregation and the placements of whites and blacks and women and children and the hierarchy of social structure. Frank was Swiss. Um, let's see. Let me just see what else I need to tell you. Okay, so let's focus on the photograph um, away from the history a little bit. When you look at the photograph, I think one of the things that makes this photograph so very successful is his ability to capture different textures. If you look at the bus um, here, you can see the top row of windows has an interesting texture to it. It is reflecting the landscape outside. Then you move down a row and see the windows open the people looking out the window at the photographer and in the end they're looking at the photographer but they're looking at you because you are the viewer um that strange distorted plexiglass above them has all of a sudden become clear because the window is open and i think that's a interesting metaphor for this work of art that the world around them was not it was not always clear to the world around segregation as to what the real social issue was or as to how awful it was to be part of or a victim of segregation um to some degree i think robert frank exposes the um problems with racial segregation uh he shines a light on the suffering that came from racial segregation and he gives exposure to why this was a bad choice um here you have many people staring out of the window you see that the white woman and two children are sitting in the front of the bus the african-american um black two people are sitting in the back of the bus. They all look out at the camera, blank faced, not a lot of emotion. The African American man looks as if he is working in some sort of factory job just based on the way he's dressed. I can see um, that was the type of shirt my grandpa used to wear to work. My grandfather worked in a factory. Um, the white children are dressed in fancier clothes. Um, as if their family works in more of a white collar job. Um, the lady who sits in the very back, uh, typically, if we think about, and of course this is a stereotype, typically women who rode the bus to get to a job in the segregation uh, where they were riding with whites often were people who worked in the white community um, as maids, as caregivers for young children. Um, and so I think that this image definitely highlights the social complications of segregation. You also see just a very visually successful photograph. You've got lots of different textures going on. The texture at the top has this um, marbly see-through image. The texture at the bottom is the image of the bus, and it has a um, metallic reflective uh, texture. And so because of that, the crystal clear focus is on the people in the center of the bus. And I think it helps to focus on the people in the center of the bus but it also helps to expose the social um, issues that Frank is highlighting. He captures the images of the people in crystal clear ways um, because he has them open the windows. 
Additionally, they they seem to confront the viewer somewhat, um, not in an aggressive way, but just in a way of, do you see me? I am here. This is um, Robert Frank's image that was published in the Blaston Globe. Um, it was a more recent article from October of 2017. I want you to notice what it is that Frank is drawn to here. Um, artistically, the thing I think that he does so well is texture. He captures, well, and part of the way he communicates is through texture because he photographs in black and white. Um, you have the texture of the men's jackets layered on top of the texture of the cement wall behind them layered on the top of the texture of the cement that they stand on, the texture of their boots, um, some of them the texture of their bags, uh, which all carries you to this texture of the face that is white with black dust. Uh, that is the coal miner's um, occupation. Uh, he is documenting what life is like for the coal miner. So if you're interested in Robert Frank, I happen to really love his work. It is a window into what life was like in the late 50s. Um, I highly encourage you to do the Delve Deeper activity that focuses on Robert Frank. So another one of my favorite artists is Diane Arbus. Here you can see an image that she holds that she photographed herself. Um, she happened to be in Central Park one day and there was this young man who um, was disabled. He had um, hands that were all curled up and she wanted to take a picture of him. Um, she was busy doing her artistic thing and the young boy got anxious and wanted her to just take the picture and hurry up. And so um, she eventually does take the picture. It's here. Uh, it is child and toy hand grenade from Central Park. Um, she captures this image of the young man frustrated with her with this grimace on his face. Um, but you can see that he is thinner in the legs. He looks a little bit like he has some malnourishment. Um, and he's holding his toy hand grenade. So this image, um, is called Untitled and then it's female impersonators backstage in New York City. I was, I'm imagining she was, um, filming uh, drag queens getting ready for a show. Um, this particular image just sold on April 3rd. That's like nine or 10 days ago for $20,000. Um, some people feel that she is the most distinguished American photographer in the 20th century. She was known mostly for black and white photography, um, but she did take more photographs of children, um, famous figures, and then this one falls into that same category of people living on the margins of society. Um, she was born in New York, and she first gets interested in photography because her husband, Alan Arbus, was a fashion photographer. Um, when they get divorced... She is studying with Alexei Brodovich, who is the art director at Harper's Bazaar magazine. Um, in the early 1960s, she begins producing compelling portraits of people that are on the outskirts of society. She received two Guggenheim fellowships to support her work in the 60s, and she taught at Parsons School of Design. In 1971, she commits suicide while she was still at the height of her career. Um, 
a year later, the MoMA holds a retrospective of her work, and um, the Aperture Foundation that was started by Alfred Stieglitz publishes an accompanying catalog to her work um, and sold 12 million copies of it. One year after she died, um, she was selected as the first photographer to represent the United States in the Venice Biennial. So a sad story, um, obviously a conflicted soul, uh, but gave us a beautiful view into a world that sometimes we don't always see. So this is John Cage. Um, he was a composer and he wanted to communicate emotions through music. And so he ends up creating performance art. Um, performance art was avant-garde in the 30s and 40s. But by 1939, uh, Cage begins to experiment with the prepared piano. Um, he also experimented with tape recorders um, and recorded players and radios. In 1943, he takes a percussion ensemble and um, has a concert at the MoMA. This establishes his work as the uh, avant-garde and is the very beginning of a new type of art called the happenings. Uh, the very first happening was performed at the Black Mountain College in Asheville, North Carolina. We'll talk about that Black Mountain College here in a little bit. But he really feels like no one gets what he's trying to communicate. And so he changes direction and tries to open up the listener's ear by inviting a style that focuses on taped and electronic music. He felt that the daily environment gives us opportunities to hear music that we haven't really considered music before. And he's not the very first composer to think that way. Um, I can think of a music title that was written, I unfortunately can't come up with the name or the date of the author or the composer, but um, it was a symphony that was written from New York about New York street sounds, and it's a really beautiful piece of music. So he's basically saying that there's music all around us, and that the music around us could be composed and orchestrated. The happenings were basically early performance art um, where the whole world was a stage. There was a sense of audience participation and they often used just found space. It wasn't space that was contrived or controlled. It was just one of those, hey, we pick this space to do our art. Happenings tend to bombard the viewer with sensations, um, visual sensations, sound sensations, taste sensations. Um, and the viewer has to make order out of the disorder. It has a very sense of disorderliness to it. Um, this is the first experimentation in 1952 um, at the Black Mountain, Co Black Mountain Arts College in Asheville, North Carolina, you see here a map. It is the map in which Robert Rauschenberg photographs the work of art. Um, there is a painting hanging from the ceiling and a dancer that dances around the stage in different configurations. Then John Cage sits at the lectern and the audience sits in the center of the work. This way they're highly including the audience in the experience. 
Alan Capro was more known for his works like this one called The Yard. In 1961, he is living in New York and he's a student of John Cage's. And he's got a gallery opening. So he decides that he's going to create a work of art that involves the gallery goer. And he fills the back lot of the gallery with tires, just used tires. Um, there are sculptures underneath the tires and he just places them right over top of the tires. Um, he wants the viewer to walk through the tires to get into the gallery. Um, and he wants them to experience the entirety of the tires. He wants them to experience their smell, their texture, the dirt on them, the color of them, the sound of what it's like to hear yourself walking over the tires. At that particular time, if you went to a gallery opening, you were dressed formally in a nice dress. Men wore um, suits. And he found it fascinating to take in film of their struggles in climbing over the tires. His work focuses on recontextualizing something taking something out of its usual surrounding and putting it into a different surrounding and using it in a different way. Um, this image is by Ives Klein. Um, he is jumping off of this wall onto an empty street with an expression of happiness on his face. Below him, there's a bicyclist that rides off into the distance, um, who's sort of minding their own business and not even noticing Ives Klein jumping into the void. At the end of the street, there's a train that is passing by. Now Klein, dies unexpectedly in 1962 at the age of 34. And ever since he's passed away, there's been a mystery about how he photographed this particular stunt and did he get hurt doing it? The piece was partially made to protest the space race. Um, it's the concept of leaping into the void. Um, it documents something called a nouveau realist performance. Ives Klein was a shaman, um, but he was also a showman. Um, he aimed at not only making art immaterial and demonstrating the presence of absence, but he also wanted to levitate into a different dimension. And so with his wacky ideas, we often think of him um, as being talented, but strange. <laughs> this next artist I'm gonna introduce you to is Vanessa Beecroft. Um, she was born in April 25th, 1969. Um, she is an Italian contemporary artist from Genoa, but now lives in Los Angeles. 
Um, her work is a combination of conceptual ideas, aesthetic ideas, and yeah, conceptual and aesthetic. Um, she creates large scale performance art that usually involves live female models that are often nude and video recordings and photographs of her work. Um, the work that she takes videos and photographs of are usually exhibited in shows, but are also considered separate works of art. Um, she did a performance in 1998 called VB35. The performances that she does are existential encounters between the model and the audience. Um, Beecroft is interested in how the models feel. Do they feel ashamed? Do they feel gawked at? Um, she's interested in the voyeurism that takes place from the audience's part. This type of performance art is lumped into the happenings because it is reliant on the audience to be complete um or to complete to give information to Beecroft's point about voyeurism about sexism in our society things like that um typically Beecroft utilizes some sort of design element that unifies all the models in the work of art in this case, you see that everybody that's wearing shoes is wearing red shoes. Some models aren't wearing shoes at all, but the red shoes stay constant throughout the work of art. Um, it creates a sense of connectivity to the work um, or unification to the work. But really, what Beecroft's poking around about is how we define our identity um, how, what's the relationship between the model and the viewer? Um, some people think that Beecroft's work is about fashion. In fact, as I was researching it, two magazines put her in the fashion category. Uh, other people put her work in the performance art category. It's really all of those things. Here you see um, one of Beecroft's works in which she has put the models into a historical concept text. Um, these are sculptures from classical antiquity. And so she's making this uh, making a statement about art and how, the idea of voyeurism was formed in the first place about um, the historical context in which um, we look back to as being the masters and that the women that you see here are the modern day versions of the women that you see sculpted. Um, originally, Beecroft made paintings, and then she started doing her photography work um, within very specific spaces. So what's the difference between um, performance art and a happening? Happenings seem to make use of 
impromptu spaces, spaces that aren't specifically contrived or set up as an environment. And the artwork is the performance that the um, artist is doing um, and the audience is participating. It's a back and forth participation between the audience. That is the art. For Vanessa Beecroft, that's very different. This is completely performance art. She um, sets up the scene. She sets the models in the scene. She photographs, she films, she films other people's reactions to the scene. Um, some people feel that her work is too in your face. Other people feel like her work is brilliant. Um, some people feel like her work is exploitative of women. Um, she, she is saying, this is how society treat our women. And some people say, well, the very thing that you're trying to combat, you're doing. Uh, by making the models stand for long periods of time, by not allowing the models to have clothes. Um, some people feel that her work is just as oppressive as work of women has been throughout the history of art. She fights the ideas of mass marketing and the ideas that women always have to be subject to the male gaze in order to sell um work she's exploiting the idea that naked women sell um but then she capitalizes on it because her pieces sell and they sell for a lot of money um the last piece i looked at at sotheby's sold for ninety five hundred dollars um a piece prior to that was twenty thousand so She's making money off of the same concepts. Um, Vanessa Beecroft is a fascinating artist um, and somebody I definitely encourage you to do a delve deeper activity on if you find her work to be um, curious. So this work of art is by Carolee Sheeman. Um, I've had a really hard time ever getting a true understanding of Sheeman's work. Um, but as I've researched it specifically for this class, I've found her work to be kind of fascinating. It is conceptual, um, as is most for performance art. Um, her methods are somewhat shocking and unorthodox. But I'll explain to you what's going on and perhaps you will see some interest in it. Um, Sheeman was someone who performed methodically and repeated um, the performance over and over again in extended sections of time. She had influences from Eastern religions, ritual repeated rituals were repeated over and over again in Eastern cultures. Um, we think of Marcel Duchamp as an artist that shocked the world with the fountain. Um, but Carolee Sheeman, I would say, was up there in terms of shock value to the world. Um, she performed a work of art called Meet Joy at a festival that was based on free expression in Paris in 1964. Duchamp himself saw the show and was shocked. Um, he declared that her performance was the messiest work of art that France had ever witnessed. And Chahiman's mm, work of art involved semi-nude men and women, including the artist herself, rolling around on the floor in bikini briefs, slathering each other with blood red paint while clutching a dead fish and a raw chicken. Um, this scene was almost operatic in scale. The music chosen was a pop score that her husband had written. Um, sh 
Shahiman at the time was working with the Judson Dance Center. And in the 1960s, she was part of an artist collective that found meaning in movement and everyday actions. Um, in basic actions like walking and running and things like that. Um, Meet Joy was carefully choreographed and captures the spontaneity and the joy of physical contact as well as the general air of sexual liberation at this particular time in history. Um, here is another image of Meet Joy. Um, this is one of her works of art where the, um, artist is dangling from a harness and drawing. Um, it is called Her Limits and it was done in 1976. There was a work of art called Interior Scroll, which was part of an exhibition of paintings um, in which she created a performance. Um, she was nude. And... reads a book of writings that were um, written by her. The writings included a large amount of misogynistic responses that a female artist could expect to encounter in her career, such as to be mistreated wherever your success or increases or decreases and they will patronize you, humor you, try to sleep with you, want you to transform them with your energy. Um, she's basically responding to the experience she's had with artists like Picasso, who looked at women as people who were muses, not necessarily as uh, skilled equals. I encourage you to um, find out more about the painting or the performance piece called Interior Scroll that I just got done describing to you. Um, this work that you're looking at here, Carly Sheeman up to and including her limits is um, also one that I find to be quite fascinating. I've seen other artists um, take this idea and push it to see what they can do with it as well. This is another division of um, performance art called Gutai. It was done in Japan. Um, and I want you to watch this video on it. It's a short video, but it gives you a better idea of uh, what Gutai was about and what its premise was. Um, I don't have as much background in Eastern art, and so because of that, I feel that it's good for you to watch um, the YouTube video because the guy who is teaching you about it is an expert in that area. So please, please, please watch the Gutai video. Okay, so Fluxus. Fluxus was a group that was founded in West Germany. Um, their style peaked in about 1962, but they weren't all from West Germany. They were from all over the world. Um, George Macianus um, had a gallery in New York where he held Fluxus festivals, but they were sort of a loose band of artists. They really weren't um, 
closely related like the Impressionists were. Um, they sort of intentionally held avant-garde festivals so that they could be part of the avant-garde or so that there was an outlet for avant-garde art. Um, lots of important artists had a vague connection to the movement, like Joseph Buyas, Yoko Ono, Joseph Buyas, I already said. Um, Buyas was influenced by the movement and Nam Paik, um, who makes significant contributions to the world of art with his video television art was probably the one that you know the best. Um, it began as a movement in 1962 and was built upon the ideas of John Cage, Yoko Ono, and Robert Morris. Um, it was a reaction to or against the symbolism and expression of the happenings. Um, first shows were represented in the same gallery that Alan Capro showed yard in that piece where he made people walk over the tires to go into the show. Um, it was noted for blending different artistic media and disciplines. It takes its name from the Latin word meaning flow and has a more structured feel and focus on everyday activities. Okay. So let's talk about Nam Paik. Nam Paik of all the Fluxist artists was probably the most um, prominent and best known. Um, he was internationally recognized as the father of video art. Jun Paik um, creates a large body of video work that included video sculptures, installations, performances, videotapes, and television productions. Um, he has a global presence and influence and his innovative art and visionary ideas continue to inspire new generations of artists he was born in 1932 in seoul korea um to a fairly wealthy family uh his family leaves korea in 1950 due to the korean war um they start in hong kong and then go to japan where Pike goes to school to the University of Tokyo. Um, he then goes to Germany to pursue his interest in music composition and performance. Um, he meets John Cage and George Masiunis there and becomes a member of the neo dadists or Fluxist movement. Um, in 1963, he has a legendary one artist exhibition at the Gallery Parnassus in Wuppertal, Germany. This features his prepared television sets, which radically alter the look and content of television. He immigrates to the United States in the 60s and settles in New York City. Um, where he explores his video art further. Um, he has exhibitions of his work at the New School and at the Howard Wise Gallery. In 1965, he was one of the first artists to use a portable video camcorder. And then he works with the Japanese engineer Shua Abe to construct an early video synthesizer that allows him to combine and manipulate images from different sources. Now you have to remember, this is all before the craze of graphics in um, video graphics. So video digital television art was very um, avant-garde in the 60s and 70s. Um, the video synthesizer that he was able to um, create transforms his ability to make moving images. He invents a new artistic medium with television and video. Um, this creates an astonishing range of artworks from 
um, videotape uh, based art to the television shows which you see broadcast from places like the Pompidou in Paris. Um, eventually in the 80s, he became sort of the um, it guy in terms of avant-garde art. Um, two retrospectives were done of his work and they featured him in international art exhibitions that were very important, including the Venice Biennial and the Whitney Biennial. He now has opened the Nam Jun Pike Art Center in Seoul, South Korea. Other fluxists that were important were Kubota. Um, she performs a painting called the Vagina Painting on a July 4th um, festival, a July 4th Fluxus festival. Um, she attaches a paintbrush to the back of her shorts and squats to make painterly marks on the paper on the floor. Um, she was challenging the assumptions that were still prevalent in the art world at the time, which connected masculinity to creative genius. Um, and we've talked about those. We've talked about those stereotypes that seem to go along with this type of, um, with visual art, the idea that women are to be muses and not to be artists themselves. Um, she is one of many feminists that take on abstract expressionism, uh, which was looked at as a genre characterized by macho male practitioners like Jackson Pollock. Okay, so this is the art of George Brecht, and I'm just going to be honest with you, I don't know as much about him as I know about the other performance artists. Um, many events were presented as a written score. Um, this particular work has 69 cards that have written instructions on them that were to be performed by the reader. The cards were collected and published in, di in editions. Um, the three prompts were ambiguous because the Fluxus artist wanted to be able to blur the lines and boundaries of what was thought to be art versus music, action, and object. So the reader is given a card and is given the choice to follow the cues or not and how to follow the cues. Thus, the re reader becomes the artist and the audience is part of the art as well. Um, so I have some sort of processing questions for you here. Um, this is performance art, is definitely art that's uh, ha like the happenings in that the audience becomes part of the art and the artist works with the audience to make the art. Um, here on the left, you can see one of the um, cards that the audience member would have received. So I guess the question then becomes, was the audience member who was participating in the art part of the art? How does the audience become part of the art? Or how does the audience become the art? Or is it part of the art and should it be? So those are my like delve deeper questions for you there. Um, you can research this work of art and add it as a delve deeper option if you like. Um, it is not in my delve deeper slides. Um, read a little bit about more about George Brecht so you fully understand his art. Um, and that would be a delve deeper that you could do as well.
So Yoko Ono was a very important part of the Fluxus movement in the development of conceptual art. Um, she was a performance artist, a filmmaking artist, and experimental music artist. She was born in Tokyo and moved with her family to New York in the mid-1950s. Um, she graduated from Sarah Lawrence College and um, over the next decade after being at Sarah, Sarah Lawrence, she moved from New York to Tokyo and then to London. She had a great influence over the movement of fluxus and conceptual art. Um, her earliest works were often based on instructions that she communicated to the public in verbal or written form. Um, just like in this particular piece, she had given verbal instructions to the person to um, come and cut her clothing. In 1964, she completes more than 150 of her instructions in her groundbreaking artist's book, Grapefruit. The instructional... The instructions range from feasible to improbable and often relayed upon, relied upon the reader's imagination to complete the work. Um, the book turns poetic, it's humorous and unsettling, it's idyllic. Ono's very instruction pieces anticipated her later work like cut piece, which is what you see here. This was a piece, a performance piece, in which people were invited to cut away portions of her clothing. Um, this particular work of art was similar to that where I explained that she had, um, her earliest pieces were pieces in which she dictated instructions and people would follow the instructions. Here she invites people to walk on a piece of canvas that's placed directly on the floor, either physically or in their minds. Um, this piece could have easily been overlooked because it seems like very simple piece, but it radically questions the division between art and the everyday. Um, Yoko Ono was married to John Lennon and, um, she had, they had many conceptual works of art that John Lennon, um, John Lennon participated in, including a work called Bed In, which was a week, lore, week long anti-war protest, um, in which they stayed in bed for an entire week uh, and communicated their commitment to social justice. Yoko Ono was not one that wanted to combine her work to a gallery or a space. Um, she continues to perform avant-garde um, type work she has a band called the Plastic Ono Band and promotes wor world peace through her ongoing War Is Over campaign. Um, she creates work that blur the boundaries between art, politics, and society. In recent years, she has embraced social media to communicate her artistic and activist messages to an even broader audience. Um, some of her works uh, like bag piece are purely performance works. Um, it was performed during a Fluxus festival at the MoMA in New York. <laughs> um, these type of works where she's dictating instructions are instructions that range from being feasible to completely improbable. Um, and sometimes they rely upon the reader's imagination to complete the work.
bag piece is a work of art that is part of a greater body of work. Um, there are seven images all together. Uh, if you are interested in the additional images, I would suggest you look at the MoMA's website. It has quite a bit of information. So in the last slide, you heard me explain that Yoko Ono is not one to want her work to be confined to a gallery space. Um, and she creates these wishing trees. Um, the one that you see here is in California, in Southern California. Um, after the trees are completely filled with wishes, they will then be um, shipped to Iceland and buried. Um, the thing that I find so interesting about these trees is that they are a tribute to John Lennon and his song Imagine. I highly encourage you to do more research about um, Yoko Ono's tree project. It's quite a beautiful conceptual artwork. Um, in the next slide, here you see a YouTube link that you can copy and paste and watch this little news story about Yoko Ono's um, wishing trees. All right, so let's talk about Joseph Bouillez. He is a performance artist who's often considering Pol who's often considered a polarizing figure in the world of art. Um, his work explores exoteric philosophies of German mystic Rudolf Steiner. He adopts a shaman-like persona as a vehicle for his performance art. Um, some feel that his work is cultish and sensational Others believe his work is that of a genius. So here, Bouyes, you're seeing a picture of Bouyes's work, How to Explain Pictures to a Dead Hair. Um, it is a performance piece in which he demonstrates a sense of an opinion of his about society. Joseph Bouya's work is about social change through art. Um, he was a German soldier and ended up being a prisoner of war in World War II and it definitely shaped his viewpoints uh, in, in life. Um, and so I want you to watch the video link on the next page that will sh explain to you more thoroughly and give examples of Joseph Bouyez's performance art. It's difficult to explain the performance piece when you don't get to see any of the performance. So I ask you to watch this next segment. Um, by copying and pasting the uh, URL into your browser and watching about Joseph Bouyez's work. <laughs> 